The, and he is uh, in the faculty in the ag or in the economics department at Iowa State. Lee is um, in his team, and he'll have others that he'll and Russ worked on this project, and others that he works with at Iowa State. But uh, one, one thing I really appreciate about Lee is his ability to to focus and really help with us put the numbers together on the swine side. And uh, again, we really appreciate what Lee's been able to contribute to this project. Many other areas that he works with in the for the swine industry um, out of Iowa State. And he's going to visit about some of the economics and in, in the developed calculator uh, focused on this area. All right. Well, thanks, Joel. I always wonder if a fellow K-Stater will claim me, and this time it wasn't. But after the football game Saturday, I'm not sure if I claim K-State either. So. Well, we're, I'm just going to take a few minutes to, to talk about uh, the economics and more specifically looking at a calculator we developed. If you were here for yesterday's talk on sow mortality, it looks a lot the same, but we're specific to uh, wean to finish mortality here. I want to give credit to my, my co-author work uh, that worked on this with me, Russ Yukin, that, that helped out with a lot of the spreadsheet and, and information behind this. You know, to highlight this, uh, this is from USDA. They actually have a, a estimate that they release for post-weaning mortality. Uh, it's part of their PDI estimates that they release in, in April of every year. And, so you can look at the number of post weaning mortalities that's increased over time. Uh, if you measure it against slaughter, you could do it against pig crops too. You can kind of get a percentage of post weaning mortality. Um, and that's increased generally over time. Um, we actually have improved in 2021 compared to 2020 for obvious reasons. Uh, but overall, you know, this is consistent with the trend we've talked about of increasing po post weaning uh, mortality there. Importantly, though, you know, these are averages, right? So um, this is, there's a distribution behind this uh, where, you know, some farms would be higher, some farms would be lower. When I'm going to talk about uh, mortality, the economics, it's the marginal changes, right? So I think we need to, to what that one percentage point change is um, and understand what that is for a farm that's potentially much higher than this or potentially much lower than this because that matters too of my starting point on that, that wean to finish mortality. So when we talk about this calculation, uh, and I do need to give credit to some fellow K-Staters, um, you know, they had this calculation as some of their farm budgets uh, to look at mortality. Uh, what we've done here is really operationalize it and allow producers to go in and change a lot of the production assumptions to really tailor it to, to their individual operation. So what do you need to operationalize that? Well, you need the, the percent mortality on your operation and, and also what that improved mortality would be, the value of a, of a finished pig, and then the, the feed or marketing cost adjustment because there's going to be some savings um, depending on when that pig dies. And so the earlier that that pig dies, the more savings you have or the less sunk costs you have into that, that pig, right? And so that matters um, when, you, when you look at it. We're going to look at, at the, the value of, of uh, the opportunity cost, so that's why we're looking at the value of the finished pig. There is a few economic speak uh, things that I, I do want to highlight. Fixed costs don't matter at all in here, right? So if you have increased mortality or decreased mortality, that's not changing the mortgage you're paying on that building. It impacts economic efficiency, and over time that matters, but it doesn't impact your fixed costs. It impacts variable costs, and we'll go into that, and that's that, that marketing cost adjustment, uh, feed cost adjustment there. Also, the biggest one, and, and what I hear often is, you know, we can just value this mortality by how much I got sunk into that pig, right? So it's the feed cost, the non-feed cost, the fixed cost, whatever I want to do is I'm just going to say the value that pig is that, right? Well, I want to give you an example to hopefully get rid of that thinking, right? So let's go back to June 2020. I could have bought a wean pig for on average about five and a half dollars per pig. You could have actually got it for a buck, and to be quite honest, you could have got some for free, right? If you think back to June 2020, right? So that would be the value that pig at that particular point, if you just think of when I, when I purchased that pig. There'd be some delivery and things on top of that. 
Now, if I go to October, when I could market that pig as a market hog, look at what it's worth. 162 on average, a little bit higher, depending on how I sold it. So depending on what my market price was. So when I'm going to value that pig, it's worth this opportunity cost. That's even after I fed it too, right? So that's, um, you know, that's the value there versus what I, what I would have had sunk into it. So that's important to look at what we're looking at is that opportunity cost here. Also, how I sell those pigs matters too. So in the, the economics or market ledger, it's price discovery, right? So do I sell those hogs negotiated, which is about 1% of the market, or what, and more, more commonly, what's my formula, right? Is my formula tied to a poor cutout? Is it tied to a nego negotiation, or is it some combination? Because when we look at prices, and so this is June 2020, this is June 2021, and June 2022, Obviously, prices have gotten a heck of a lot better, right? That's important. But even then, there's a pretty wide distribution. So back in June 2020, some pigs were about free, up to about $100 per hunter weight, depending on how I had discovered that price, right? That matters in my, that value of the pig, right? What's that worth? And even today, or last June here, you know, we had about a $50 or so per hundred weight spread on that, that lean hog price. So that very much matters. And so you know, that's going to impact uh, profitability, and it's going to impact the cost of mortality. So some of you may be familiar with the ISU Estimated Livestock Return Series. This is for wean to finish, profitabilities in, in black and red there. And we also have a, a calculation for mortality or death loss. We assume just uh, a static death loss in that of 6%. Um, but if you use the USDA data I showed you earlier, obviously a higher percent. It's a higher death loss in there. And that very much is correlated with profitability and prices. Right? So you know, we, we're in a fairly high death loss scenario now because of the higher prices that we're facing. Now the question at hand is, what's it worth to obtain an X percentage point change in mortality? The answer, it depends. It depends, hopefully I've convinced you that because it's that value the market pig. That's going to vary by producer. It's going to vary over time. Um, and we're going to take the approach here that I don't know the cost. And those costs are going to vary farm to farm, right? There might be an animal health intervention. There may be a, a management or a labor change, right? We've heard a lot of that today already. I don't know what that costs necessarily, right? It may be a, a particular feed change. But I can tell you what the benefit is worth, and then you can compare that to the cost. And that's going to that's gonna change a lot of times, too, that cost potentially you know, as the price of feed increases or decreases, as wage rates, labor availability changes, that certainly can change here. So that's hopefully the value of this tool here is it's not a one shot, this is what mortality is worth. It's we can run this as we're approached with a new environment, a new situation. So hopefully help us guide this optimal level of mortality. The optimal level of mortality is not zero on any farm, right? Because that last few percentage points are too expensive to go after, right? Because of just too many environmental or uncontrolled things, you'd almost have to have a perfect environment to achieve that, right? And so what we're trying to identify is, you know, what is that, those few percentage points? And it may be different for a farm that's much lower per mortality to start with compared to other farms that may be higher. So the percentage point changes there. Our tool is available on our Ag Decision Maker website. We, we provide in a PDF a uh, user's manual or a guide that walks you through uh, the, the tool in itself, gives you an example. And then the tool here is on our spreadsheet. So it's an Excel spreadsheet uh, to easily download. And what you bring up first is uh, the production assumption. So yellow uh, cells, which are a little hard to see here, 
are, are cells that you can change. And most of these are yellow. There's a few white ones in there uh, that would calculate for itself. So for this example, we're going to compare an operations at 6% to go to 5%. You could start at 10 and go to 9 or 8, whatever that is. I'm just assuming that for this example. We're going to assume that the average weight of dead pigs is 150. Now you can change that. That can be 100 pounds for both scenarios, or we could have it different, right? And if you have it lighter weight here, would say maybe I'm going to have some more savings because I'm going to, those pigs are going to die at a lighter weight, uh, potentially the ones, the ones that, that do. We allow for some feed efficiency to change. And then everything else is the same. So that assumes that, for example, you know, hog prices, they're the same regardless of my mortality in there. I'm getting the same price. It's just the value of the pigs that I have to, to sell. And those, var those variables would all be the, be the same. The output is, is supplied in a couple of different formats. The first is looking at the partial budget change. So what we're looking at here is the revenue change, the cost change, and then the total change in, in net income. We're going to compare to 0% just to give us a comparison. That's not the really one you need to focus on. The one you're focusing on is the difference here. So as I compare 6% to 0%, you know, I'm losing out when I take the hogs and the manure value by about $13 uh, per pig there or per head. Uh, when it's 5%, I'm losing out on, you know, $10.50. So I'm losing out on less revenue. I'm incurring, you know, a little bit more cost here on the current versus the 5%. What's important is comparing the, this $8 to, to $7 here. And what that is is it's $1.43 per pig is the cost of a one percentage point change in mortality. Now that is very much based on these assumptions, right? And the challenge there, so I don't want you to go away from this talk and say an Iowa State University says 1% mortality is worth that. Because these are out of date right now, right? What are, what are pig prices? They're about $50 per, or uh, $100 for, for the first half of the year or so, but they're nowhere near that right now, right, if I look forward. So we need to be really focusing on, you know, those current market conditions, those for my individual operation. So that's why we do sensitivity analysis. And this, I would argue, is the really powerful thing uh, of this tool. So it allows us to compare, if we just change two factors here, What's that impact? And the take home here is, so if I take the base case, and my base case, remember, was $100 carcass weight. It was $6 mortality. And if I just change to 5% mortality, if I keep lean hog prices the same, that's worth $1.43, right? Now, if I change, if I'm at 6% mortality, but carcass prices are 102, that mortality is worth a lot more, right? Because my opportunity cost is a lot more. Now, if I go from there and reduce to 5%, it's actually a little bit worth a little bit more. So it's increasing at an increasing rate. So as I move to the up and to the right there, I get a bigger bang for my buck, not surprisingly, right? Because the hogs are worth more and my mortality is less. As I move this way, it hurts me a lot more, right? Or you could argue there, it's not as valuable, right? Because I'm already losing money on those pigs. You can see this graphically, and this is available in the tool here. So, you know, an extreme is if you go down to $96 lean hogs, which is still a pretty darn good price, right? But we're dealing with much higher costs in this environment. The only one where the income was over the cost was at this small relative mortality of 4%. Right? Feed price, it, it's, it's the, you know, the, the scenario here is flipped. So as feed price increases, it becomes less profitable to feed pigs, right? And so here, you know, it's, it's a negative increase, and I'm seeing a in decreasing rate here 
for that, that uh, value or the opportunity cost for, for those pigs. And you see the flip, flip side there. So again, at really high feed costs, I need low mortality to have a chance of potentially breaking even. All else equal. Then feed efficiency would be similar here, whereas I'm more feed efficient, right, the value of those lost pigs becomes greater. So again, this is where the tool's available. I'd encourage you to, to, to download it, download it, you know, use it for, for your individual inputs there, because that allows you to, to really tailor it to your situation and compare that benefit to whatever costs you, know, you may be presented with um, from a, a possible intervention to decrease mortality. So is there any time for questions, Joel? Or? Yeah, thank you, Dave. Okay. So if there's a question for Lee, and we'll have the other speakers come up, what we're going to do is uh, we'll allot time to about 5 after 12. At 10 after 12, the other big session starts with all the wrap-up information. Since we're across the street here, uh, we can go to about then and still get over there and get you settled. So we'll have about 10 minutes for open questions if you'd like, but we can start off with Lee as we bring the other speakers back up. Also, I'd like to mention, too, at the end of your rows, uh, we got some postcards of information, how to access all the information. If you wanted to grab one of them about the project and all the resources uh, that's available through that. Yeah, so the question was on the stocking density. Was that stocking at placement or stocking at marketing? And to control for the trial, we did it stocking at placement. Yeah. The, the initial, so when we looked at our production records, we had been stocking at 6-7, but that would be 6-7 at first cuts. Um, so... Yeah, my question is also to Christine. So after you apply all those improvements, starting from, uh, I think, in the nursery or in the post, uh, uh, or uh, I think in, uh, during the cycling, up to finishing, if you calculate all those mortality decreases you have, what will be the final decree that you have? Because at the beginning, during the introduction, the mortality coverage up to 30 35%, but in your case, do you substantially decrease it in total? Yeah, great question. Uh, so if, if we're lucky enough to have no PERS um, throughout the process, we would have on average a nursery mortality of one to one and a half percent. And then finishing mortality was anywhere from three to five percent. And that would be our, our top barns where everything went correctly and we followed all the protocols correctly. It's not that right now. We do have PERS and that complicates things. Um, but if Everything's perfect. We need to finish mortality anywhere from four to six percent. Christine, thanks for sharing the data. So very, very good. Uh, in regards to your use of the Pomotel AC, any reason that you do uh, in water, not in the feed? And uh, is that decreased water intake for the cells? Any? Any comments on that or? Yeah, great question. Um, so we initially went through the water because we were doing a, a room by room trial, so it was easier to do it by room, but found that when the farm had control of the station, uh, it got done successfully. When we would run, we, we did try through the feed, um, but you got gestation bins and lactation bins right next to each other and we'd get medicated feed dropped in gestation. Um, so for that reason, also just the, VF the VFD side. So we're targeting mycoplasma suis and, you know, some other things, reducing colonization of different mycoplasmas. Um, 
So not overly comfortable writing a VFD for, for those. Uh, as far as the water intake, um, it is bitter. So not, not an appreciable difference in water intake. Our, you know, sows still perform well, but they definitely, you can tell that it's, it tastes different. Kate, I have a question uh, for you on the grow finish biosecurity side is over time has Hanor done any changes in transport biosecurity from you know from the nurseries to finishing or particularly from finishing to packing plants and back has, has there been any changes over time that you've adopted or have seen um, meaningful impact on? Sure so um, you know over time we've continued to try and increase you know our practices so any wean pig, uh, trailer, you know, would be washed clean and baked, um, and then from there on out, all of the uh, nursery to finisher and uh, finisher to market are all contract haulers. So on the nursery to feeder pig transportation, um, we have about half of those, that's probably a little bit more than that today, that um, do actually have a bake, but again, they are done through uh, contract haulers wash um, and so I definitely can appreciate the differences between going to a uh, wash that's owned and operated within company and designated for sow farm transportation uh, as to the cleanliness of those trailers compared to what you see um, on the contract side and so that's been one of the, the challenges right of trying to understand is is that's why you see so much early introduction of these diseases into the finisher. Is it related to contract hauling and maybe cleanliness there? Or is it the fact that maybe the farm wasn't clean to start with? There's a lot of factors there that we're still trying to understand and evaluate because um, the timing is interesting, right, of those introductions of FERS. And then on the um, market haul side of things, um, we do wash a fair amount of trailers. So generally anything, we generally market in four cuts and so the first three cuts will be a uh, washed and hopefully disinfected trailer. Um, but then on fourth cuts, we um, will allow trailers to be unwashed. And so, you know, it's a challenge every day to, to um, look at those costs and, and fight for washing even more trailers, uh, just because that is pretty costly, right? Um, but we've been working on some projects to try to understand when we have uh, coronavirus outbreaks during finishing, if those are related to having that unwashed trailer in there or other things. And I'm still working on some of that data and um, have some students that uh, are still kind of finishing wrapping that up. And so uh, it's definitely interesting as we start to look at it and hopefully more in the future we can talk about whether um, you know, we can associate some of those late breaks to having unwashed market trailers in there. So um, you know, always constantly trying to improve but to realize that when you're dealing in this contract world, trying to get um, your level of expectation for cleanliness uh, every time you need it to be done is, is challenging. Christine, um, you talked about, well, we've seen the, at least a lot, is a lot of post-weaning enteric situations going on, whether it's rhodosapa, E. coli, um, salmonella. And you talked about your bio-clean. So, so how do you feel that was important as far as eliminating some of your post-weaning rota problems? Yeah, I, I think it was the most important step. So we historically tried some other, other cleaners um, and didn't, I didn't really understand the chemistries. You know, we were running it. We thought it was great. And then when we tried the alkaline detergents, um, that's when, I mean, all of a sudden you had these like yellow gross floors. You apply your detergent, all of a sudden it's white again. So you can visually see it. Um, the other buy-in, honestly, is just speed of power washing. Our crews, they don't want to use it, or they don't want to not use it anymore because they can wash in half the time. So it's been a labor savings, but yeah, absolutely. We would we don't wash any nurseries or farming rooms without the BioClean. All right. Once again, we'd like to thank everybody for coming and being part of this session. Really appreciate all of our speakers for all their candid and direct information. And uh, again, if we can obviously follow up with any of the speakers on information you'd like or anything about with our survivability project, we're more than happy to partner or talk about opportunities with them as well. So thanks a lot and uh, 
Uh, appreciate you being here.